Well, good afternoon. This is, or good evening, depending on when you're watching this. Um, this is a lecture about essentially moments of inertia. In this case, moment of inertia um, for areas and a mass moment of inertia. So two topics which are spread through a number of um, sections in Chapter 10 in the Hibbler um, Statics book, which these lecture notes are based on. And you can also see by the topic header here that we'll talk a little bit about parallel axis theorem. Use it quite a bit. Um, radius of gyration will at best be a reference. Um, for what we need in this project, the radius of gyration probably is not um, a factor. So we're going to focus on parallel axis theorem in the moments of inertia for areas and for moments. So this topic, again, we, we're not sure whether this is going to help you. I believe it will in terms of your dynamic analysis of the car. It may or may not be um, new material to you, but at least it will be a review. For some of you, it may be new material, depending on who you took the original statics dynamics class from. So what we're going to talk about today, as I mentioned, the parallel axis theorem. We're going to talk about how to determine the moment of inertia for a composites area. So that's the area moment of inertia. And then again, the same sort of thing, explain, try to understand the concepts behind the mass moment of inertia. Um, so we'll refer to the area moment of inertia as MOI and the mass moment of inertia as MMI. But they're very similar concepts, so it does make sense to put these into um, one <coughs> explanation, one topic, uh, lecture topic for today. Um, oops. So, in-class activities for today, um, of course the homework, uh, you do not have any assigned at this point. Um, we'll have a, the normal set of quizzes and then the content as well as some uh, sample problems. So we'll proceed through this and you should be getting used to these sorts of um, lectures at this point. So again, the um, first thing out of the box will be these reading quizzes. And so, first reading quiz. Parallel axis theorem for an area is applied between an axis passing through its centroid and any corresponding parallel axis, any two parallel axes, two horizontal axes, or two vertical axes. So take a moment to think about that, reflect back on your previous work and what the parallel axis theorem meant. So, now that you've had a chance to think about it, hopefully you decided that A is the correct answer. Again, the parallel axis theorem, as implied, is between two parallel axes, but in this case, one of them has to pass through the centroid. So, you cannot use it between just any parallel axes, but one of those has to be through the centroid. So, second question, moment of inertia of a composite area equals the blank of the moment of inertia, and again, in this case, that would be area moment of inertia of all its parts. So you may recall that there were two ways, two ways to calculate moments of inertia. In this case, area moment of inertia, one was by integration, which most of us tend to not like, and then the composite area approach, um, which most of us feel much more comfortable with. So your answer would be, and think about it, look at the answers there, provided for you. If you recall much about it, much about this process, you would remember that it is B, essentially the algebraic sum, where we add or subtract the um, contribution of individual um, areas that we sum together um, to come up with the moment of inertia for all of the parts. So another question, the parallel axis theorem can only be applied to only the MOI, only the MMI, and again, that MMI is mass moment of inertia. Both the MOI and MMI, or the area moment of inertia and the mass moment of inertia, where they're defined there in blue for you. So what would you choose? <coughs> Now, 
Well, the formulation is a little bit different. Essentially, the same theorem, same structure can be applied to either. So the answer is C, um, both the MOI and the MMI. Again, the formula is slightly different uh, in terms of the parts, or I shouldn't say the parts. The components are the same in the formula, but the things that get substituted into that formula do vary depending on whether it's the area moment of inertia or the uh, mass moment of inertia. So, some applications. Um, why this is important to us, particularly in things beyond even this project of the um, suspension analysis. But structural members, whether they be in a car or particularly in buildings, as most of these pictures will be, um, but sometimes smaller machines, that sort of thing. Um, beams and columns, they have so cross-sectional shapes um, well beyond just a round and a square. So you have an example here of an I-beam you can see on the right side of the screen there. Um, but there are HC columns, there's all sorts of different shapes um, that come prefabricated from the metal places to us. Um, so the question would be, why do they not typically have that solid rectangular, square, circular cross-section? So what property drives these different sorts of shapes? Um, you can think about it as essentially an economic argument for using less material, less steel or iron, um, to get an equivalent sort of um, performance. So the shape does have some importance. Now, what primary property, if you will, from a design and engineering standpoint does, is influenced here. And so that's what the topic of the day is about. So we have tubes rather than solid squares or rounds. And why would we go to tubes as compared to a solid round? In fact, why is most of the structure on the mini Baja car made out of tubing as compared to solid rounds or square pieces? Um, so there's some real good reasons why we do these things. Um, ideally, as I mentioned earlier, the drive is to have similar strengths, but with less weight. I shouldn't say just strength, but also resistance to stress and that sort of parameter. So we want to talk about these parameters of the cross-sectional area that influence our selection as designers. So we can look beyond metal in fact, there are many wood structures built um, that utilize similar sorts of shapes or um, assemblies. In this case, we have a T sort of beam. Um, and the cross-sectional area here is, again, the combination of two simpler shapes. Um, this, the, essentially, the dimensional lumber that you would find at the lumber yard, um, what might nominally be called two by sixes or something, or this looks like one by sixes. Um, could create these different shapes. So if we had a way to figure out the moment of uh, inertia, um, either area or mass for these areas, that's handy. And again, the composite approach that I talked about earlier that you probably have experienced is typically easier than the integration method. Either is possible, but typically for most of us, the less mathematical, the more straightforward approach of using the integration method I mean, of the composite method, wins out over the integration method. So here's another example of a built-up shape out of, um, in this case, wood. So a more complex beam with the two plates and the two internal um, support mechanisms. So these sorts of built-up beams or members are often used. And we're focusing today really on one of the key design principles that support why these are done and how you would analyze them. So these design calculations, in other words, what load stress these can carry are typically required on this idea of some sort of moment inertia. Could be ma mass moment inertia or the MMI or the area moment of inertia, depending on what sort of characteristic we're looking at. Usually for many cases, the moment of inertia, the area moment of inertia is sufficient for some of the simpler design calculations. So some definitions. So thinking about these three different shapes, A, B, and C, from left to right, um, they all have the same total area. If you look at the blue shaded area in each one of those options, they all are the same. They add up to the same amount of material, in other words. 
And so if they had the same type of material being used, they would all have the same amount of mass per unit length. So these three different shapes, and if we have it in a load situation as shown on the far right, um, where it is pin supported and a roller, pin supported at R and a roller at S, and a load applied center span called P. So which one of these shapes, A, B, or C, will have the less or the least internal stress and deflection? Um, deflection, of course, would be external, stress would be internal. Um, so looking at that same load case applied to all three, which one of these shapes would have the lowest amount of deflection, which is often very important in a structure, um, and as well as the less stress? So think about that for a second. This is where it'd be nice to have you in class because I think it would be interesting to see what you, um, what you would respond here. Um, basically, even though they all have the same amount of material in them and the same amount of mass, in other words, essentially A here is the one that will be the strongest or have the least deflection. And it's all dependent on that moment of inertia of the beam about the, the x-axis that's drawn here on the screen. Note the x-axis sitting there. So um, section A has the highest mass moment of inertia, or area moment of inertia, sorry, um, because, and simply put, because the bulk of its area is the furthest from that x-axis. So it has the least stress and deflection. And again, you'll notice if you're looking at the book in these sections, I'm bouncing around through some of these sections because I felt to me that the material made the most sense uh, sometimes and if it came in slightly different order. So we've talked about parallel axis theorem or at least had some quiz questions over it. Hopefully you remembered some of those things from your previous class. But in summary, and I won't go through the development and you can see on the screen or read at your leisure some of this content, but basically, it allows us to, by calculation, relate the more typical area moment of inertia um, around that X prime axis, which goes through the centroid of this blob shape. So that's the typical moment of inertia that we would find for this shape. What our interest in is being able to transfer that, in other words, what is the moment of inertia of our blob here, but not about its centroid, but about this other parallel axis, in this case, the x-axis. So that's what we're really trying to do. And that's useful, particularly when we try to take this more simplistic approach of composite areas to calculate a moment of inertia, particularly of a complex shape. So we use the parallel axis theorem to do that. And again, this is the same picture here. Um, and the picture is really related to the derivation, but all I'm going to do is focus on the results for our use here today. And so, because this is a 2D picture, we have two different formulas for I sub X and I sub Y. And again, this is I here stands for that moment of inertia. Um, in this case, the area moment of inertia around the X and the Y axis. Even though the blob is out here in space and its centroid is at some distance from those two axes. So basically the bottom line is, is you take the standard moment or moment of inertia or I sub X or I sub Y around its centroid. So these are about C. And then we add this com component, if you will, of the area times this distance squared. So the distance there varies based on which axis we're talking about. So dy is the distance from the x-axis to that centroid. And again, this is a 2D case. And then we have dy, which is the distance of the centroid from the y-axis. So if we're looking at I sub y, in other words, the moment of inertia around this y-axis, then we are concerned about that dx distance. Square it times the area of the blob. 
So it's a pretty straightforward formula. That area times the square of the distance to that parallel axis is added to the moment of inertia in, at the centroid. Um, again, related to that specific axis. So you may want to think about I sub y, I sub y prime, and then we have to use the dx because that's the distance again from the y-axis to that centroid. So that's kind of it in summary, and again, that formula is pretty straightforward. Um, you want to think about what those mean in words, get the concept down, and I've tried to explain it to you here. But make sure you think it through and can explain it to yourself, in your own words, of what this formula is trying to do. Because it will help you, I think, in later use of this formula. And again, we have to use this formula to calculate via the composite methods process, um, composite shape process, to find the moment of inertia of more complex parts. So, here is one of those composite areas. Now, this is a made-up shape. Um, kind of looks, uh, so we've got a rectangular section, hollow in the center, um, along with this kind of crown shape, uh, a cone shape on top of it. And so we think about these composite areas are basically adding, subtracting simple shapes, rectangles, triangles, circles, etc., um, so that we can come up with these more comple complex shapes. Now, most of what we're going to talk about is going to be 2D in this case, um, but you can think about this thing being extended into that third dimension, but normally these shapes are consistent as they are extended into that third dimension. And so we can do everything on essentially a slice um, to, for our calculations. So keep in mind that you subtract things. So this minus the interior rectangle is how I make the hole. I actually create a hole by subtracting something, in this case a rectangle. But you could do the same thing in a round. You could subtract out a circle that would be in the center of that round. So we typically will use some sort of reference table. In this case, you have one in, the, in your textbook. Um, or hopefully you still have that textbook, as I've said before. And you can go to the cover of that and find this, the standard calculations that were developed via the integration method um, for these simple shapes. I don't have those memorized. I wouldn't expect you to have them memorized. And so we typically want to use these tables to make sure we've got them right. Um, and so our problems that we will be looking at um, in this lecture I don't always show the full form of those because we are expecting you to be able to look at your book um, or a table from some other book. They're all pretty much the same um, to be able to find those formulas. So we can use these to basically put together um, the moment of inertia for a relatively complex shape in ways that are much quicker, much more straightforward, much uh, less error prone than trying to do it by integration. So now I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. You can see section 10.8, which is the mass moment of inertia. Now it keeps, it has much in common with the area moment of inertia that we've been talking about, but we'll just hit some of the highest point. So again, the setting here is you've got a rigid body, because now we are looking at some sort of three-dimensional situation, typically. And so the rigid body, in this case it's a blob, but instead of 2D, it's 3D. And it's got a center of mass at G. Now notice, we're just, we're, now we're talking about not a centroid in terms of area, but a center of mass. So here's our center of mass at G. And at any given point, we can do this by integration. Again, we're just going to look at results. But think about the concept. This thing is free to locate or rotate about Z, so on its axis, so it can spin like this if it's got some torque that's going to spin it. And so the body will start to rotate, again, with an angular acceleration of alpha. Alpha could be zero if it were already rotating and rotating at a constant angular velocity. So this torque and alpha, um, the angular acceleration, are related by this formula. And again, we're not going through the derivations of the torque is equal to I times alpha. Um, so again, What's I? I is the mass moment of inertia, um, or MMI, about that z-axis. Now, keep in mind that this whole idea of moment of inertia means resistance to something. 
So I don't have this on the screen, so hopefully you're, you're um, not having to just look at what's on the screen, but can hear the, the voiceover as well, in that when we talk about any sort of moment of inertia, we're talking about a resistance to something. So our resistance to stress, a resistance to bending, it's this idea of a resistance. So the MMI, or mass moment of inertia, of a, of a blob, a body, a structural member, measures the resistance of that to angular acceleration. So the MOI is essentially a resistance to the bending, deflection, or stress. So um, the, the common concept there is the fact that there's a resistance. In one case, it's to angular rotation. The other case, it's a resistance to stress and deflection. So the MMI in this case is to, when we talk about analyzing rotational motion um, done in dynamics, and it's similar to the F is equal to MA. So if you think about torque is equal to moment of inertia, mass moment of inertia of times alpha, alpha again is an angular acceleration just like A is in F is equal to MA. Mass moment of inertia and the mass of the object. Similar sorts of um, concepts, although certainly different formulations. So again, that's kind of the simplistic uh, way to think about it. But finding those parallels and understanding the conceptual relationships may be useful to you. So, mass moment of inertia. One of the common situations for this is in a, in a situation where there's something rotating. And in this case, we've got a, a large flywheel and a relatively older piece of equipment that's a metal cutter. So we have a blade that's, in, that's coming down and cutting uh, relatively thick metal. And so it's very handy to have a lot of energy available to cut that. And so we use these large flywheels um, connected to that cutter blade. So this principle has been used in um, machinery for, for hundreds of years. Um, and so it's somewhat similar to the flywheel that's in a car engine, same sort of thing, although the structure is certainly different. And so what property determines um, how well that flywheel can do its function, and again, it's in this case, going to be a mass moment of inertia because we're worried about rotation. Think about why most of the mass of this flywheel is out here, not at the center point. The spokes there are only really to connect this thing together. So there's a parallel here again between that I-beam or wide flange beam that we looked at earlier when we were talking about resistance deflection. Typically you want to get the area or the mass in this case away from the centroid to give you the desirable properties of either mass moment of inertia or moment of inertia or area moment of inertia. <clears throat> so the same sort of thing in a fan, a common fan, you probably all got one of these at home or perhaps in your office. If the torque M is applied to this fan wheel, um, and, uh, or M, I guess they've got it in this diagram, torque M applied to the fan blade initially at rest, its angular speed or its rotation will begin to increase. So we've got a um, moment is equal to I times alpha sort of situation when it's unbalanced. So um, again, what property, which we will call P of the, of the fan blade, do you think affects the angular acceleration the most? Well, again, it's going to be that mass moment of inertia, and so we've got to find relationships that be able to drive these analyses. So the definition, again, it's this idea of that R squared. This should be ringing a bell now from what we just talked about for the area moment of inertia and the um, equations we talked about there, and mass instead of area. So this formulation is basically the same, just the symbol, symbols have changed and what they're standing for. So in this case, instead of area moment of inertia, we've got mass moment of inertia, I, is equal to that integral of R squared dm, <clears throat> where R is the moment arm, so to speak. So it's very similar to what we had in the parallel axis theorem earlier, where, um, and so we'll see this again. So, Keep in mind that both of these properties, the area moment of inertia and the mass moment of inertia, are always positive. 
in this case mass moment of inertia, because again, look at this formula, we've got r squared dm, so we've got area, that's the meter squared or the foot squared here, and then the mass, so the kilogram mass squared or the slug foot squared using the standard sets of units that we have within the statics. So, just as we had with area moment of inertia, we also have the parallel axis theorem. And you can see here that it's structured the same way, except we have a three-dimensional blob. Okay, so. so as I was saying, the fact that we have, again, the mass now times a distance squared. Before, remember, in the previous incarnation of the parallel axis theorem, we had a um, distance squared, but instead of mass, it was area that was times that. So the mass times that distance squared from the axis again. So in this case, d is here. And so this, again, i sub z is that distance to, since we are looking at i sub z around the z axis, we want the distance <coughs> from the z-axis to that centroid, in this case along that x-axis. So the formula is very the same. Again, that key thing is now instead of mass times areas, or mass times the distance squared, before we had area times the distance squared. So again, we can do a mass moment of inertia, um, essentially by composite bodies, just as we did before. Now note the one change. This is composite body. Before, with the um, area moment of inertia, we were talking about composite areas. So again, just that difference in um, approach. One is 2D, one is 3D. One is focused and uses the mass, and the other one is focused on the area. So <clears throat> we're going to go through the steps for analysis. In this case, we're going to focus on mass moment of inertia. Um, I'm sorry, on area moment of inertia, or MOI. So we're going to look at, because that's the simpler case. So we can, if we were trying to find the moment of inertia for this um, square with a hole cut in the middle of it, we would basically do a two-step process and divide it into these simpler shapes, in this case the solid rectangle, and then we would subtract the circle. <coughs> So we have to locate the centroid of each part and indicate the perpendicular distance from each centroid to the desired reference axis. In this case, we're going to use the x-axis. So note, already we know that we're going to be using the parallel axis theorem because the centroids of these two simpler shapes are up here. This distance, perpendicular distance from our desired x-axis is the reference. So we have to determine the moment of inertia. Again, this is area moment of inertia for each of these simpler parts using, and then move it down using the parallel axis theorem. So that's our approach. And again, we find those moment of inertias of the simpler shape parts using the formulas that we get from the book's uh, reference tables. So, and then we add or subtract in this case, um, those different MOIs that we've attained in step three. And so typically you were taught, I assume, to put these sorts of things in a table. It just helps keep track of things. Um, and so the use of a table, simple table, is pretty desirable. So now we'll go through a simple example on this. And again, keep in mind that <clears throat> we're going to do a timber section here. It's got three pieces. We're going to ignore the fasteners in this process. Um, which is not too unusual. Actually, many times these built-up beams, when they're wood, may be glued, not mechanically fastened. Um, so we've got this cross-sectional area, and you can see it's kind of a simple I-beam, where we have uh, two wooden sections, and then a wooden uh, on top and bottom, and then a wooden uh, web um, that's 50 millimeters uh, thick and 300 millimeters high that's um, holding those two horizontal sections apart. So we want to find the area moment of inertia about the x-axis, and in this case, the x-axis has been given to us. When you're working these problems, it is important to draw the figure and make sure you note where your um, different axes systems are, um, just like it is in any other sorts of analysis. So our solution 
is to basically break this into three rectangles. The one, two, and three is shown here. And then take these centroids are in their center. Um, the formula for their um, moment of inertia at those centroids for a rectangle is pretty straightforward. We'll see it here in a second. And then we're going to transfer those using the um, parallel axis theorem to the x-axis. Now, the distances from those centers of the three pieces to that x-axis, in this case we catch a break because this center web is zero. Um, the x-axis is uh, located basically at its centroid, but then the top two surfaces are both at 175 millimeters, one positive, one negative. That sign is important, so keep track of the sign. One is below the x-axis, one is above the x-axis, so you have to keep track of that as well. So, <clears throat> From the inside back cover of the book, we know that the moment of inertia for a rectangle about its centroidal axis is this 1 12 space times the height cubed. So we can implement that for the um, shapes, keeping track of which one's the base and which one's the height. Obviously that depends on its orientation. So of item 2, in other words the web, we have the 1 12 to 50 millimeters times the 300 cubed because that's its height. Um, which is equal to the answer shown there, the 1.125 times 10 to the 8th millimeters to the 4th. I would recommend keeping the units simple uh, in this case during your calculations rather than converting all of those as, we, uh, as you can see us do here. Then using the parallel axis theorem, so um, and again we're going to take um, I sub x to I sub x3 equal I sub x3 um, I sub x prime a dy squared. So we have the essentially, and this is these, we're do, now doing the calculation for this piece and this piece. Sorry if that wasn't clear. So the I sub x1, the one here is um, this upper web or upper flange. Um, three is the lower flange. Um, because they are similar sizes and shapes, we can do this calculation once. Um, as effect. So 112 times the 250 cubed plus then that distance and the area squared. So um, you can see the answer there and you can follow the calculations essentially applying the parallel axis theorem. So now we have to sum those three to come up with the overall size of x. So basically first calculation, second calculation times two in effect gives us the final result. So now a mass moment of inertia example. <clears throat> First one was um, area, now this one's mass. So now we've got a slightly different situation. We've got a pendulum that's hung from point O and it is five kilogram um, plate then suspended from that link, suspended at O, so we've got that three kilogram rod um, and then the five kilogram plate. And so we want the mass moment of inertia about an axis perpendicular to the screen and passing through point O up here. So the mass moment of inertia of the pendulum as it rotates about that point O. So our plan is to determine the mass moment of inertia of the pendulum using the method of composite bodies, in this case the two, the plate and the rod. So we break it into those two pieces. Now the center of mass of the plate and the rod are again, since we're trying to get back to point O, one is essentially one meter, that would be the rod and then the 2.25 meters down to the plate. Um, so the plate P, its center of mass is there, the rod center of mass is about there, um, and those are the dimensions as you see, those are pretty straightforward. So the Y bar here, the distance in other words um, that we need to know is that distance one times three 
plus then the 2.25 times the 5. So what are those? Keep in mind, first number is a distance. Second number is the mass. Right? And then that's divided by the sum of the masses. And since our units there are distance mass divided by mass, we come up with units of just distance. So the MMI on the back, um, again, for these plates and sl slender rods are given in the cover. So we're going to use those and the parallel axis theorem. So two calculations, one for the plate and one for the rod. Using this, um, their respective formulas, the rod is different than the plate. Um, and then <clears throat> using that Y bar in terms of the distance that we need um, in that second part of the calculation. So the 1 12th times the 5 and these, um, the areas there, um, in terms of this again is for the plate, so the 0.5 and the 1, is basically the formula for its mass moment of inertia about its centroid, and then we are moving that up to O. So you can see those calculations and the same sort of thing for the rod. To get then the final is that we have to add those two things together. So again we have I sub O is equal to the I sub P plus I sub R. So going back to a concept, set of concept quizzes here and I'm assuming I'm going through the calculations relatively quickly there because I'm assuming you can Follow those at your leisure as you're looking at this. Um, this is kind of along the lines of our discussion we had in class the other day where you wanted me to um, spend less time on some of these aspects and focus a little more on some of the um, concepts to allow you to uh, review these on your own. So our first concept quiz. So in this case, <clears throat> we've got an area and we know the centroid's location, which is here at C. And we have the distances D1, D2, and D3 essentially between varying axes through this um, shape. And we know the moment of inertia about axis 1, which is not through its centroid. So I'll make that clear. We can determine the moment of inertia about axis 2, this one, by what? By doing what? By applying the parallel axis theorem, but between which axis? So you've got a set of choices. Directly between axis 1 and 2, two parallel axes. Between axes 1 and 3, in other words, up to the moment, or the area is centroid, and then from that centroid back down to the axis 2. So that's item B, choice B. And then you've got C, which is between axis 1 and 4, and then 4 and 2. So, or none of the above. So, thinking back, I have already told you the answer to this earlier, um, but you may or may not remember. Hopefully you remembered when I was talking about the um, parallel axis theorem, that it can only be applied between the centroid, the centroid of the shape, and this parallel axis. So that means we cannot go between 1 and 2 directly as much as it may be tempting to. So we have to use two applications of the parallel axis theorem. In other words, B, we have to go between 1 to 3 and then from 3 back to 2. So we've got two sets of calculations to do there because we always have to be working with um, a parallel axis but then back to or related to the axis that goes through the centroid of the shape. So another question, similar sort of situation. Um, same blob shape, same axis system for the same case. Consider the moment of inertia, again this is area moment of inertia, about each of the four axes. About which axis would the MOI, or the area moment of inertia, be the smallest number? And of course, just axis one, two, three, or four, and then E, you don't have a clue. 
So think about it for a second. Hopefully by just visualizing the parallel axis theorem, you recognize that axis three is going to have the smallest area moment of inertia. In every other case, we're taking that plus one of these others. So you're always adding something to that base um, moment of inertia at the centroid. So C is the response. Now, now this is moment, mass moment of inertia. And again, keep in mind, these are three-dimensional situations. And so we have a simple one here where we have a particle, which we've not talked about, but it simplifies things a bit. A particle that's one kilogram in mass, and it's located out here at point P, and these are essentially the coordinates for point P. So it's positive three X direction, positive four Y direction, and positive six Z direction. So that's the point coordinates, and they're in meters. Determine the uh, mass moment of inertia of that particle about the z-axis. So think about it. You've got to do a little calculation here. Okay, we've simplified this a great deal because it's a particle. So basically, um, what we're dealing with here is the second term in the parallel axis theorem, um, where we basically have um, the mass times the radius squared. So we do two pieces to that. So you have to do it for both the x direction and the y direction because we're going back to the z-axis. Z so basically, it is, what, what am I saying here? It's essentially that r squared dm. Writing's not very good there, but the r squared dm. So it's 3 squared um, times the 1, that's the mass, plus then the 4 squared times the 1, um, and so then we, that totals 25. So the answer is C, 25 kilogram meters squared. So now that I've written all over the screen, I'll not bother erasing it because I think you can still see the text, but 4, consider this rectangular frame made of four slender bars that have four axes that are passing into the screen. So basically, um, axes are perpendicular to the screen at those four points. Um, keep in mind that S, I'll give you a hint here, S would be um, the centroid of this shape um, and the mass centroid of this because they're, um, of its position. But you've got S, P, Q, and R. And so about which one of the four axes will the MMI of the frame be the largest? Okay, so we're looking for the largest number. And again, the way to think about this is the concept I've been talking about before, which is basically things farthest away give you the largest mass moment inertia, area moment of inertia. That's why the flange is on an I-beam. Um, the flywheel mass as far as away as possible from the centroid. So in this case, the point, the axis that's the furthest away is essentially Q. So the answer is B, Z sub Q is going to be the largest um, for the mass moment of inertia of the frame. So a little bit of problem solving, and again, this will be back to a area moment of inertia or just moment of inertia 2D case. In this case, again, just to show you a little better in terms of the table implementation. Um, so we've got this shape. 
You can see it's composed of, you probably already visualized the components that we're going to use, and we want the moment of inertia about the x-axis again. So our plan would be to essentially create three shapes, a, um, essentially a rectangle A, um, the circle B, and then that triangle C. Now, two of those are going to be subtractive in nature. In other words, the B and the C, we're going to take out of the larger rectangular shape A to come up with the result. So again, we're going to use the, uh, the simple shapes. The formulas are in the back of the book, uh, back cover. And so it's important to get the distances down. The distance um, for A to its centroid is 150 millimeters up. Um, it, from, to the circle, it's the same. And then to the triangle, and again, you've got to go back and think about where is the area centroid for a triangle. Um, a one-third, two-thirds, depending on your point of view of the base. So that's going to be essentially 200 uh, millimeters. There's our shape. And so now we're going to, I'm not showing you a table here, but the I sub X, X sub B, and X sub C. So basically, we're applying the formula from the back of the book. Um, in this case, this is, of course, for the larger rectangle. So it's the 112 base times the height cubed, then plus the parallel axis portion of relating that back to the x-axis. So um, the 350 times the 300, which is, again, the um, area, and then the 150 squared, which is that distance. Um, and the same sort of calculation for the other three. But then we have to sum it. And in this case, the a sub x, uh, that's our answer, is x sub a minus these other two pieces. In this case, both of those distances were positive in terms of up here. So we didn't have to uh, worry about that. They would have been squared. Um, so then we get the final answer. So pretty straightforward. You could also show it in a table. So that's a brief review of area moment of inertia and mass moment of inertia. The reason we wanted to go through this is to, as we analyze the vehicle when it's moving for the suspension analysis as it's getting ready to impact, um, we'll have to use some dynamics. And so the next sections we'll be talking about will focus more on the dynamics, but to be able to understand some of the terms in the dynamics equations we needed to know and have this review, we thought, about the mass moment of inertia and area moment of inertia. So this is just kind of the first step in getting you ready to start talking about the um, analysis of um, the more complex dynamics that we'll be facing because we will have um, essentially rigid body dynamics where the car will be represented by that rigid body and it will be moving and having the impact with the obstacles. So this is preparatory material, although we took it, even though it's in the static section, we put it into the dynamic section, just because it fit with that content a little better. It's why we need to know it, is to be able to do the dynamic analysis. So um, I look forward to seeing you again in class, and um, hopefully this material is helpful as you review the statics content that you probably had back in the past. So I hope the rest of your day goes well, and thanks for tuning in.